Fergan, Jody, and Rowena, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I'd like to start off by talking about the investigation. Um, you describe in your book that the investigation started off with the first phone call that Jody had with Rose McGowan. Um, could you describe to us how this phone call came about and how Harvey Weinstein and these potential allegations uh, appeared on your radar in general? Certainly. Um, first of all, I, I want to say that we really are deeply honored to be here tonight for two reasons in particular. One is that Megan and I have done a lot of speaking over the last two years, and there's no audience that is more important to us than students, so thank you for bringing us to you, your university. Um, if anybody here is thinking of becoming a journalist or an investigative journalist, you are our people. Uh, we want you, um, so thank you so much for coming tonight. And we're also just incredibly moved to be here with Rowena. Um, the three of us have come a very, very, very long way together from our first meeting, or should I say non-meeting, um, which we will tell the story of tonight. And to be here at Rowena's uh, place of education and to be able to now talk about uh, your experiences and our experiences reporting on you so openly um, is, is, is really a precious <coughs> opportunity. Um, so to answer your question, um, the first page of our book, she said, is about the frustrating fact that Rose McGowan refused to talk to me initially at the start of the Weinstein investigation. Um, she said, your newspaper is sexist. Uh, I don't, you know, essentially I don't believe in you. And it's about that puzzle that every journalist faces um, when someone declines to speak to you. How can you possibly open them up, not in a manipulative way, but by truly making the case uh, that they should contribute in some way to your story. And that particular story came about really not because of Megan and I initially, it came about because of a huge commitment from the New York Times to sexual harassment reporting. This was never just about Harvey Weinstein. In the spring of 2017, our colleagues Emily Steele and Michael Schmidt published an extraordinary story about how Bill O'Reilly, the American TV host, had paid off sexual harassment accusers for decades. I know that seems like it was 100 sexual harassment stories ago, but that story was a game changer for two reasons. One, it showed that this trail of settlements, instead of sort of uh, precluding the possibility of a story could actually become the story, could become the, fi the financial and legal trail that we wrote about. And the second thing is that Bill O'Reilly was fired. I know his name may not mean as much uh, in the UK, but think about an incredibly loud, pugnacious, influential conservative host who set so much of the political discourse in the US, an immensely powerful figure, a, a sort of key figure in the Murdoch empire, if that translates a little better. The idea that he could lose this job because the New York Times had reported this kind of story was a game changer. And it, it caused the editors to ask what is now, I guess, a very quaint question. They said, are there other powerful men in American life who have abused women and covered it up? And that's what led us into looking into Harvey Weinstein. So leading on from that, if you um, look and read into your investigation, people will notice that there are two main channels from which um, your sources and Weinstein's, vi Weinstein's victims came from. So there was Hollywood actresses, and then there was Weinstein's employees at Miramax and the Weinstein Company, such as Marina. Um, so could you talk a bit about this first category and how, how it was that you reached um, names such as Ashley Judd and Gwyneth Paltrow, and how is it that you encouraged them and eventually um, led them to go on the record? Mm -hmm. Well, it was it, certainly there were these two categories of alleged victims, the famous actresses, and those were the first women that we had the first set of secret hushed conversations with. And one of the reasons we wrote the book is because so much of investigations of this kind take place off the record, in secret, and we really worked hard in the course of reporting the book to bring all of those secret meetings onto the record so that readers could be with us the first time that we met with Gwyneth Paltrow in her home and she was describing her experience when she 
you know, she had been um, basically the first lady of Miramax um, at Harvey Weinstein's first company and uh, sort of seen as completely um, untouchable and one of the most sort of famous and, and, and prized stars to come out of his movie Empire. And so that was a real jaw-dropping moment for us um, when she started to open up and tell us that in fact she had been um, one of his victims. And she was, she like so many other of the actresses that we were starting to have these secret conversations with was willing to tell us her story, but was really scared of going on the record. Harvey Weinstein's power and influence was so massive that even women like Gwyneth Paltrow, who seemingly have all this celebrity and power, were scared to, to go on the record. And so we quickly realized that we weren't gonna be able to break the story if we waited around for, these, for the famous actresses to go on the record, that we had to set out on other reporting paths. And so slowly but surely, we started to see these other category of victims, women who had gone to work for Harvey Weinstein, at, first at Miramax and, Har and, and then at the Weinstein Company. Often it was their first job college out of, their first job out of university. Uh, they had ambitions in working behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. And you know, if we were able to ultimately tra trace um, allegations of sexual harassment and sexual assault against those employees stretching from 1990 to 2015, there was a really memorable moment for me in the summer of 2017 where there was a woman who had been, who had worked for Harvey Weinstein in 1990, sort of fresh out of college, and she had disappeared from, from, from the workplace uh, following an alleged sexual assault. And so I was able to track her down in a home outside of New York City, and she, she sort of opened the door and said, you know, I have actually been waiting for somebody to knock on my door. I've been waiting for this, this knock on my door for 25 years. And, uh, but like a lot of the women that we encountered along the way, she had been silenced through a secret settlement. And so we also realized as this other category of alleged victims came into view, that we were also running up against a huge challenge and that so many of these women had been legally silenced through financial payoffs uh, that they had been advised were their best if only course of action. So um, I'll come to these financial payoffs and settlements in a second, but I wanted to talk about um, some of the other obstacles put in the way to silence your investigation and these women. Um, so in your book, you talk about the role that Black Cube, the private investigative agency, uh, played in silencing individuals such as Rose McGowan. Um, could you explain exactly how Weinstein um, used these institutions and resources to protect himself? Sure. But, you know, he, you, he did so many different things in so many different ways, but we'll give you a couple of examples. By the way, one thing I think we should also add um, that has to do with Weinstein's methods, but also the kinds of women we spoke to, is that coming to the UK is very meaningful uh, for us because I think what not that many people realize is that British women were at ground zero of this investigation. The typical image of a Weinstein victim is of, you know, a famous blonde actress in a ball gown, but that's not the case. I mean, we'll, we'll talk some about Rowena's story, and there are also two women, Zelda Perkins and Laura Madden, who were absolutely critical. Zelda was the first woman with a non-disclosure agreement to speak with us. She couldn't go on the record for the first story, but she allowed us to write about her, which was essential, and then she broke her NDA afterwards. And Laura Madden uh, lives in Wales. She lives in Swansea, and along with Ashley Judge, she was, um, she was one of the first two women on the in the world uh, brave enough to go on the record about Weinstein. So, so, it, so your question reminds me of a com of uh, in the first conversation I had with uh, Laura. She said, you know, normally I wouldn't talk to you, but I'm talking to you because of a call I got from Weinstein's people a week ago. And a former Weinstein assistant um, had called her, and this was more of a carrot than a stick, but he, she was trying to persuade Laura not to speak with us. And she called us cockroach journalists. And you know that, that was sort of method one, I think the sort of softest, lightest method, which was just to sort of bad mouth us, to, make, to try to make people scared of us, to tell people not to speak to us. But he also used methods that were really extraordinary, including the hiring of Black Cube, which is a firm of Israeli ex-intelligence agents 
Um, they do some of the things that private detectives do, but they go far beyond it because they actually try to dupe and manipulate people. There was this agent actor type who I got an email from in the summer of 2017 who claimed to be a women's rights advocate from London. She claimed to be putting together a sort of fancy corporate feminism conference where she wanted me to speak. I blew off her email because I was too busy actually working on the Weinstein investigation to talk with her, but it turns out that she was not what she represented to be. She was a black cube agent and she was in the business of uh, trying to get not only journalists, but m more importantly, alleged victims to share information. Um, so that was some of it, but Weinstein also used a, a really prominent feminist uh, attorney, Lisa Bloom, um, to try to back him. He hired a kind of all-star cast of uh, PR people, fancy lawyers. Um, we were writing by the end under legal threat. He threatened to sue the New York Times. But one thing we always want to emphasize is that although these methods were very elaborate and they were terrifying for some of our sources who don't have some of the institutional protection that Megan and I have, they ultimately didn't work. They were no match for somebody like Laura Madden of Swansea, Wales, and the story she had to tell. Great. Um, touching a bit on, as you mentioned, Lisa Bloom and Gloria Allred, who were considered the country's leading feminist lawyers and they were deemed by W Magazine to be defenders of women. Through your investigation, you found Allred and Bloom to be involved uh, with the settlements that we Weinstein had reached with all of these women, um, and Bloom was in fact representing the producer. Um, so I want to ask, how is it that you reconcile kind of their earlier contributions towards the feminist cause um, and their achievements with kind of their support for Weinstein? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. And actually, before I answer that, to go back to Black Cube, this private investigative firm that was on our trail, Weinstein had basically promised this investigative firm that they would receive $300,000 bonus if they put a stop to our investigation. And another person who worked on that secret campaign was a British journalist, uh, Seth Friedman, who had, uh, you know, who had written for The Guardian, and he basically got linked with Black Cube and the Weinstein case and was reaching out to journalists and other women that Weinstein you know, suspected might go on the record and claiming that he was working on an article and trying to fish out information that he'd then pass back to Weinstein. So that was another kind of jaw-dropping moment for us to realize that this, you know, somebody who had appeared to be an established journalist had crossed over to, the, to this other side to work on behalf of this, you know, Black Cube and by extension Weinstein. But Lisa Bloom was probably one of the most jaw-dropping moment for us. This was, I mean, if, you know, she is probably one of the most prominent victims' rights attorneys in the United States. She has made a name for herself and kind of cultivated legal celebrity by representing victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And in 2016, she crossed sides and went to go work for Weinstein. And we, we knew some of that. Like, she came into focus as we were doing our reporting. She was by his side at the end when he was trying to, to fight back publication. But, you know, she, and, and once that came out, once our first story was published in 2017, she got some heat for it. And she apologized and she said, well, I only went to go do this because I thought that he had made inappropriate comments towards women and I wanted to help him apologize. I wanted to help him see the error of his ways and apologize. And in the course of reporting this book, we were able to obtain confidential records, her billing records, an hour by hour accounting of exactly what it was she did for him. And also this, basically this memo, a, a, a kind of a job audition in which she spelled out for Weinstein all of the underhanded tactics she was prepared to use on his behalf to undermine Rose McGowan and you know, ultimately other women who, who he thought were gonna come forward. So it was clear that her a, a knowledge of what he w had done was much deeper and that the role that she played was much darker. She was basically saying, I will <laughs> smear on your behalf, I will manipulate, I will lie, I will basically take all of my experience working with victims, harness that and use that with, on your behalf to work against them. And so, you know, we were, when we asked her about that, when we confronted her with our findings, she refused to comment. She said that she, 
you know, was going to adhere to attorney-client privilege. Um, but I think that it really raised questions. Not She wasn't the only attorney who had gone to work for him who ultimately, we realized, had uh, ambitions of crossing into the entertainment industry. She wrote a book that Weinstein had agreed to make into a movie. And she, we were able to sort of document a conversation she had had with another lawyer at one point saying, this guy can really do a lot for your career. But it really raises questions and served as an example of there were a lot of surprising figures that we en encountered in the course of our investigation in terms of the people who helped bring the truth to light and the people who helped conceal it. So I'd say Lisa Bloom was probably one of the most surprising people in terms of the people who worked to cover things up. But there were also some surprising figures like Erwin Ryder, who was the longtime accountant um, in the Weinstein companies. She, he had been one of Weinstein's top executives, but over the years had been concerned about the boss's treatment of women and ultimately became one of our most valuable secret sources, ultimately slipping us internal company records that helped reveal all of these various ser serious allegations against Weinstein. So particularly towards the end of your investigation, you, the two of you, did have some conversations with Weinstein himself. Um, could you describe what these were like? What is it that you expected from these meetings? What was his attitude towards the end? Did you get what you were kind of expecting? Why don't you take that one? Oh. Well, it was interesting. It's like when you're reporting on a subject like Weinstein, you basically are collecting all of these stories about him and we you know months into it we felt like we kind of had a composite sketch that was coming into view and we had heard stories of the people who had worked with him worked for him actresses who had you know been in his movies and people would describe somebody who would swing back and forth between flattery and then basically sort of menacing threats and then at the very end of our investigation, it's part of the due diligence that you do, is that you go to your subject, uh, that you're preparing to publish all of these very serious negative allegations, and you, you give them a chance to respond. And so when we did that, that really set in motion like a 48-hour roller coaster. Um, we were on the phone with Harvey Weinstein as he was basically kind of swinging back and forth between flattery and threats. And then the day before publication, he actually like barged into the New York Times with some of his high-priced lawyers by his side and these folders of information that he had on some of the women that he knew were going to be in our story. Photos of them, you know, of, of him posed with some of the women who were going to be making allegations against him in which the women were smiling with this idea that if they had been seen on red carpets with him after the fact that it was evidence that they were lying other information from their backgrounds that he thought that he could use to smear them. And so that was something where we weren't quite sure what to do when we realized that he had basically was showing up unannounced to the New York Times. But one of the reasons that I took that meeting is that I wanted to show him what we were made of. Um, and so at the end of the day, all of his threats and all of his bullying and all of the menacing tactics that he had used to evade kind of accountability over the years really came crumbling in that final moment when he was not up against just you know, the, all of the brave sources who had pr participated in our investigation, but the entire institution of the New York Times, which was like never going to be intimidated by him in any way. Um, we'll turn now to some questions about the case itself and kind of Rowena's story. Um, so in all the cases of harassment that, or, that you've described in the book, there appears to be a common theme or what you refer to as the pattern. Um, so the woman is invited to Weinstein's hotel room in the guise of a business meeting and he abuses his power and kind of commits sexual harassment. This immediately leads to a settlement of some kind um, and the woman is silenced and paid kind of a substantial monetary sum and then there is a PR cover-up. So Rowena, could you tell us a bit about your story um, that you spoke out about a few months ago? Of course. <clears throat> so I was very young when I went to work for Harvey Weinstein. I had only really graduated from Oxford a couple of years prior to taking the job with Harvey. And you speak about a pattern and that's very typical of his uh, assistants when they start off working for him uh, that it's typically their first or second job out of university. Um, we, Zelda Perkins and I, at the time, worked as Harvey Weinstein's European assistants. So we were based in London and our job was to travel with Harvey across Europe to either film festivals or where different films were shooting for Miramax. So we could end up in location at different places, France, Italy, uh, typically we'd go to film festivals and sort of similar um, cities. So on the occasion of this particular sexual assault, um, I was at the Venice Film Festival. And when you say that people are called to Harvey's hotel room 
for business meetings. Um, I think that refers more to industry executives or actresses. I think the difficult thing about being Harvey's assistant is you're with him throughout all of his waking hours. And so the way that our working life worked is that the first assistant would wake him up in the morning at 6 a.m. and she would stay with him on her own until about 10 a.m. And then I would, the second assistant would come on duty and then we would have a sort of 12 hour shift until 10 p.m. So on the particular night of the assault, it was a very typical pattern in the sense that the first assistant was out attending a dinner or a gala or some kind of glamorous event with Harvey and she would return with him to the hotel suite, in this case Zelda Perkins, and she would settle him for the evening. And I, as a second assistant, um, it would have been my role to read a number of scripts that were in the office, to organise the office, to make some calls to um, you know, other international cities that were still working, and then await Harvey's return at 10. And then there would be a period of time until 2 a.m. where we would be doing some kind of office work, either making international calls, um, setting up scripts, and discussing the scripts that I'd read. So it's important to emphasise that it was part of our work to be in the hotel room late at night. Um, it wasn't a social occasion, I wasn't invited there for a business meeting, I wasn't there for a drink, but it's part of my shift work that I would be working and discussing scripts. So then Harvey's modus operandi in terms of when he moved in on assistance was he would make a pretense that we were at work. So a lot of the discussion would be about the scripts that I'd just read or it'd be about um, things to do with the office, opportunities for advancement. And as Jody and Megan portray, in the way that he had, he, he veered between charm and bullying for those outside of the company, it was a very similar sort of process for those within the company. So, you know, he would talk about how he valued our opinion on the scripts and he um, valued our insight into, you know, I, I read English at Oxford, so we talked a lot about story development and character development. And I think as a young assistant, you're really made to feel that you can shape the films that Miramax makes in the future. And that's a sort of very attractive thing. But at the same time, there's also inappropriate conversations. So he would ask questions about my private life, about who I might be dating, about my family situation, about uh, where I was born and uh, what I aspire to do more generally with my life. And then interesting and sort of insidiously, if you have a boyfriend, he would start to ask questions about the boyfriend. He would say, um, who are you going out with? What do they like? Do they also work in the film industry? If they work in the film industry or a related industry like music, I can also help them and I'd really, really like to meet him. And I'd like to take him out to a fancy hotel or a fancy dinner. And so in various ways, He's insidious in terms of trying to get into your life and get into your private life and persuade you that there's a deal with the devil that can be struck, that you know, if you are willing to have sex with Harvey, it can really make, your, make or break your career. And, but if you don't play the game, he'll make sure that you don't, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but he'll make sure that you don't work in the film industry again. Um, so from then, it resulted um, to the next stage, which was the settlement. Um, could you talk a bit about um, what it felt like when the settlement was being made and did it feel like this was the only way to get justice for what you'd been through? After the assault in the hotel room in Venice, I um, reported it immediately to Zelda Perkins, who was the other assistant working with Harvey at the time and my closest colleague. And to be honest, it was a big jump to the settlement, so I just wanted to explain a bit about our thinking. At that time, we were 24 and 25. We had very few resources at our disposal. We were on business travel at the Venice Film Festival. It sounds ridiculous, but we had gotten there through limousine and private jet. The only access to any kind of finance we had at our disposal was a Miramax corporate Amex card. So it wasn't as though we could just get up from this hotel room and either report ourselves, turn ourselves in to Italian police, we didn't speak Italian, we didn't have any idea where the police station was, or suddenly disappear and go home to London. So it seemed prudent, although we very much wanted to do something right away, it seemed prudent that we should at least wait until we got back to the London office before we thought through our next steps. But Zelda immediately confronted Harvey and she put certain self safeguards in place that I, that the two of us would 
for the rest of our time at both film festivals work together and we wouldn't be alone in it or certainly I wouldn't be alone in a hotel room with him. So that, that is how we safeguarded ourselves for the rest of that particular trip. And then when we went back to London, we um, started what turned out to be a very complicated process of trying to escalate and to expose Harvey for the things that he had done. And so internally at first, we spoke to more senior women at Miramax, um, saying that this had happened, uh, saying that other women were at risk and so on, and trying to find sort of help internally, um, which turned out to be very difficult to do. Um, it wasn't our intention from the get-go to seek our own legal representation, um, but it became apparent that within Miramax, um, there wasn't any way of escalating it such that he, either he would be exposed or that, you know, he would be in any way held accountable. Because at the end of the day, as CEO of Miramax, you know, his power was really completely invincible. And so we did seek legal representation. And it led to, after a few weeks, that legal representation recommended that we um, invoke constructive dismissal. So via a fax at the time, it was 98, so we faxed our resignation to the New York office, invoking constructive dismissal and being very clear that the hostile work environment that we refer to was sexual assault and a number of other incidents, you know, particularly the, the, in the hotel room in Venice, but also a number of other incidents. Um, and overnight, um, you know, Harvey's office reacted very quickly. Um, ha Harvey himself reacted very quickly. There are a number of, you know, he left a number of very desperate voicemails on Zelda Perkins' home line and mobile phone. And, um, you know, his lawyers kicked into play. They were on a jet across London that very night. Our lawyers kicked into play. And sort of before we realised it, we ended up in um, a, la a large glass conference room uh, really brought to the negotiating table. Um, and, you know, initially, as I, as I was saying, this was really not our intention. Our, our intention throughout this entire um, process was really to expose Harvey to um, either take this to the police or to, um, because there was no accountability within Miramax, to really talk to the Walt Disney Company. Um, however, on the other side, they had quite a different agenda. Uh, and as you alluded, Harvey's way of closing people down is through settlement agreements or non-disclosure agreements and payoffs for silence. And really, as it turned, we did not know, being only 24 and 25, that this is part of his, that there had previously been NDAs. We didn't even know that there were NDAs after our NDA until October 2017. We lived in a belief that our NDA might, might be the only NDA, which, you know, in retrospect, is naive. We did not know that this was a really a pattern of behaviour. But because he isolates and silences his victims through these settlements agreements and through these payouts, we had no way of knowing what his past was or what he did to women in the future. All we could do at that time was say we wanted to expose him as a predator and we also wanted to put things which were safe, which would act as safeguards at Miramax specifically for assistance going forward. You know, so we at the negotiating table talked about things like he could not travel with, he could not spend time in hotel rooms with single female assistants. He either had to be accompanied at all times by two female assistants or one male assistant. You know, that eventually got cut out of our settlement agreement, but there was one clause that we wanted to argue for um, very adamantly. Um, and that he would go to see a therapist and that he would go specifically to see a therapist about sexual issues so that he wouldn't just say, oh, I, I've got an anger problem or, you know, I'm struggling with fame or something like that. That he would acknowledge that he had this issue with sex addiction. And we also um, tried to put in place um, just basic HR safeguards, you know, that there would be three ombudsmen at Miramax, complaint handlers, if you will, so that people could report such incidents. So, 19 years down the line, um, Jody, I think it was you that went to Irina's doorstep as a part of your investigation, and you spoke to Irina's husband, who at the time was unaware of what had happened in the past. Irina, could you talk to us a bit about um, your journey and the, family, and the journey your family went on um, since this investigation in October 2017, and how that led you to break your silence just in September this year? You know, keeping a 20-year secret is a very distinct experience. And I think when you are silenced at a very early point in your career, when you're really quite young, it is a very suffocating process. You can't speak to your family of origin. We were not 
permitted that the NDA made it impossible to seek further legal advice, to go and see a doctor, to go and find a therapist, to speak to friends from college. So it was really a complete isolation. At the point when Joji door stopped my husband, we had been married for 10 years and had four children and he didn't know anything other than I used to work at Miramax. Um, different reporters actually had come to speak to me in the intervening two decades, but by some stroke of luck, nobody had come within the 10 years that I'd been married to Andrew, my husband. Um, so I really felt like the bottom fell out of my world when he called. I was visiting my parents in the UK uh, and he called from California to say, Row, there's a New York Times journalist standing on our doorstep. Um, but I was determined not to panic and I, and I I tried to be very calm and I said, don't worry about her, she'll go, she'll go away. <laughs> they, they, they come from time to time. <laughs> they come from time to time, but she'll go away. And the story will go away. And I actually, although that sounds like a comic response, I really believed that because different journalists had come over the intervening years. And over the course of two decades, I had persuaded myself, nobody will ever get Harvey. He's invincible. He pays people off. He has people followed. They threatened at the time when we signed our NDA that they would be watching us for the rest of our lives. And, and there was really a sense that we felt like terrible, terrible things would happen if we ever breathed a word to anybody. So I didn't think, I didn't know Jodie and Megan, but I didn't think that no matter how tenacious a reporter who came to my doorstep, I didn't believe anybody could break the power that Harvey, the power and charisma that Harvey had around him. So I was bound and determined not to speak. And I really can't imagine that two years later, I'd be sitting here at the Oxford Union telling my story. Because that time I was completely terrified. I'd already kept the secret for two decades. And I watched as their article was published in the New York Times, as Ronan Farrow's article came out in the New Yorker, as the whole thing exploded and everybody was posting Me Too on Facebook. And it was a very weird feeling because different people would come and say, didn't you used to work for Harvey Weinstein? And I still maintained this absolute, complete silence. And I think, and I often get asked, why did a lot of my friends and colleagues come out, including Zelda, who was my closest colleague at the time, come out in October 2017, but why did it take you two years to get to this point? And I think that it's a multifaceted answer. Um, everybody has that very much their own journey with when they feel they can come forward with a story that is so searing and so personal and so traumatic. So I think in those intervening two years, I had to do a lot of soul searching. As you famously know, my husband didn't know, but my children were also very young. The youngest, who's actually here tonight, was only six months old at the time that this, investiga that this story <coughs> broke. And he's, he's still only two and a half now. So there are really serious considerations around the impact on my, on my children who are very young. I, I thought they'd be followed by s to school. I thought our house would be ringed by reporters. And really, once the story is out in public, it is no longer, or, although a secret is lifted, so it, it is in one way a relief, there is also the aspect of a story develops a narrative of its own and grows legs of its own. And I think I'm even still trying to understand how that works. I, I've only, my story has only gone public for a month, so I'm still very new to speaking about it. All right. I have a few more questions about the Me Too movement in general. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, Christine Blasey Ford, who the world witnessed almost a year after um, your article was published. So all three of you have interacted with her in the recent past. Um, could you tell us what it was like witnessing all of this just after your story had come out? Um, and how was, how was she similar or different to the several women you had interacted with during your investigation? Well, maybe we should answer that together because Megan and I interacted with her at different moments, right after the testimony and then in the months afterwards. I met Christine Blasey Ford the morning after the testimony. We met secretly in Washington, um, really just to get acquainted. And the reason why Megan and I had thrown ourselves into that story is that we wanted 
we were fascinated by what was happening and we wanted to write in this book about the complexity of Me Too. The Weinstein story at the end of the day is relatively straightforward it, in the sense that the pattern is so strong, the evidence, when you can dispute individual incidents, but the, the sort of whole of it is so overwhelming. And also, I think that there's a lot of consensus. We'll see what happens with the trial in January. But in terms of people's reactions to the descriptions of these accounts, there's, there's a lot of unanimity. And, and as we wrote this book, and in the year following the publication of our story, we saw some of that consensus fracture and Me Too grow a lot more controversial. There was a mounting sense of backlash, a mounting sense of male grievance. And we could see, as the Blasey Ford allegations slowly became more public, that this was going to serve as a kind of apotheosis for people's very complicated feelings um, about Me Too. And so when I met her the morning after the testimony, she seemed both exactly like the person who was on, who had been, you know, sort of on the public stage the day before, but she also seemed like such an everyday person, the sort of California scientific researcher and mom that she is. Her hair was tousled. She'd exchanged that dark suit for, you know, informal clothing. She was wearing a turquoise hoodie. And Megan and I had been, you know, really for some time dealing with women who had found that their intimate personal stories from their past had this outsized effect in the world, globally, on the public stage. But this was a little bit different because you could, there were even glimpses then that this woman had not necessarily intended to affect the public discourse um, in the way that she had, that, that she had sort of wandered onto a much wider, more brightly lit stage than she ever intended to. And when Megan picked up the conversation with her, I think that feeling only grew. Right, it was, we, we quickly realized that we really wanted to report into her personal story. And in the, like, in the coming months, so a couple months after her testimony, I actually met with her and had sort of obtained the first, you know, in-depth interview of her. She, had, she was back in Palo Alto, down the street from Rowena, uh, where she lives. And at that point, two months after testifying, she showed up to uh, a breakfast appointment that we had with her, a baseball hat pulled down. She had not yet moved back into her family home because of security threats. She was still basically living in hiding. And so, you know, on the, on, one, on the one hand, she had been flooded with, I think, tens of thousands of letters of victims of sexual assault um, and other supporters who were pouring their hearts out to her. So she had, and, you know, many segments of society was seen as a hero. But on the other hand, she was really still uh, grappling with uh, death threats and other people who really had come to see her as probably perhaps the biggest villain of the Me Too movement. And so we realized once we were able to sort of piece together the backstory, the, the behind the scenes story of her path to testifying in Washington, we realized that it was so much more complicated than either side knew. And we wanted, we felt like we had to tell that story, but we also wanted to, and you know, the, we, the last piece of reporting we did for our book was to bring together women who had been at the center of all these high profile stories. So we, uh, we conducted a group interview in January of this year. And so there were women there. There was a woman, Rachel Crooks, who was one of the first women to go on the record with an allegation of sexual misconduct against Trump, against Donald Trump during the presidential race. There was, um, you know, Zelda Perkins and Rowena and Gwyneth Paltrow and Ashley Judd, some of the women who had been at the center of the Weinstein investigation. And there was also, there was also Christine Blasey Ford. And it was so interesting. We knew what the kind of public impact of them coming forward had been, but we wanted to ask what the private impact had been. And it was so interesting interesting because, and Rowena was there, the only woman who at that point had not yet gone on the record or gone public with her story. And it was so, I think one of the most interesting things was to watch you and Dr. Ford interact. And so while she had, on the one hand, seemingly had one of the roughest times of coming forward, you still talked about seeing her as a really inspiring figure and somebody who played in your, into, into your decision to come forward. So my very final question before we take questions from the audience is actually about this particular gathering. 
Um, you, the women you described who were at this um, gathering that you had in Paltrow's house, in fact, um, are quite diverse. So you had Gwyneth Paltrow, you had Ashley Judd, all these actors, producers, um, and they were sitting alongside uh, figures such as Kim Lawson, who um, was a member of staff at McDonald's, who uh, had recently taken action against sexual harassment at the food chain. Um, so in this instance, the Me Too movement appeared to be very intersectional. It appeared to represent women from all sorts of backgrounds, ethnic, social, cultural, and so on. But in many cases, the Me Too movement still is not as intersectional as we'd like it to be. So what do you think we can do to make hashtag Me Too a movement that speaks for everyone? Well, it's an interesting question you ask because there's certainly a question about who's gotten the attention in Me Too and which cases have been brought to the fore. And in our work, I think we've We've both felt the power of the big name actresses going on the record and I think struggled with that a little bit. On the, on the one hand, we're the ones who took Ashley Judd, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Angelina Jolie on the record. Salma Hayek and Lupita Nyong'o uh, wrote their op-eds in the New York Times pages and we are very, very proud of all of those things. But we've also felt, to be honest, um, the frustration of sometimes seeing that these famous actresses' words can be weighed more heavily uh, than regular women's. I mean, we, when because the Times has done stories, you know, across industries, you know, fa factory workers, restaurant workers, female prison guards, etc. And you can be there trying to, you know, tweet out your colleague's story and get it some attention, and feel like why is the story about the factory workers, you know, not getting, um, you know, quite as many eyeballs, uh, you know, as, as the ones about the famous actresses. Um, so there's that, but I think, you know, I have to be honest, I think the even bigger struggle with Me Too has to do with the backlash um, that we feel very strongly in the States. And also, I think just a general sense of confusion and throwing up of hands. And I think that this matters for everybody because there's been a lot of change in social attitudes with Me Too, but those changes in social attitudes have generally not been locked into place by law. Laws in the US and the UK have barely changed in the last two years. And part of why it's so important that that happens is that that's when you get a more universal kind of change that affects everybody, regardless of background. And we see a lot of the controversy about Me Too coming down to basically three questions. Number one, what is the scope of behavior under scrutiny? Is this about classic sexual harassment and assault only, or is it also about unwelcome advances that don't involve touching, verbal harassment, an unwelcome hand on somebody's back, et cetera, et cetera. Also included in that first question, how far back do you go in time when you're looking at these allegations? Question number two, how do you get to the bottom of what actually happened? We know how we do it as investigative reporters, but I think if you go to a random HR department in the US or the UK, there's a lot of confusion about how you ascertain what actually happened. And then number three, the question of accountability. It's very, e it's very easy to call for accountability generally, but it's much harder to assign. If somebody has committed a low level offense that they apologize for, is that a firing offense? There's a lot of controversy about that. And what we've noticed is that these questions become intertwined in a way that makes them even harder to answer. For example, there's a senator, Senator Al Franken in the US, who resigned his Senate seat because of some of these allegations. And so within hours of him resigning, people, including fellow Democrats, were debating whether or not he should have had to resign this Senate seat. But that was before the facts were even clear and there was even a sort of consensus on what the guy actually had or had not done. So, you know, as reporters, we cannot solve these questions. These are for all of you to answer. But what we hope we can do is, you know, we're reporting and investigating every single day. We're still trying to shed light on what actually happened. You can't solve a problem you can't see. 
And we're also hoping to be as clear as possible about these questions and how they intersect so that all of them can try, so that all of us can try to answer them together. All right. We do have time for some questions from the audience. If you have a question, um, put your hand up and a microphone will come to you. If we go to um, the hand in the front row over there in the maroon jumper, yeah. The one there in the front row. Hi, thank you guys so much for coming here. This is, I think your reporting has been inspirational for everybody, not just women, but everybody around the world. Um, I had a question from a technical perspective, and this is before um, people really came out and kind of dive, like, like disclosed who they were. So how did you deal with confidential sources and like publishing so many confidential sources in the original article? Because, you know, if, if you read it, it was a lot like, this person can't speak out loud, this person like can't really disclose who the identity is. And I think when it comes to trust with an institution, like the public doesn't know whether it's hearsay, if it's actually happened. So how did you guys build that credibility with the audience who was reading the piece to say like, you know, we actually fact check this, it's not just something we made up. And how did that affect the reporting? Yeah, I mean, well, actually, if you do go back and look at that, um, at, at our first story, there were two women who went on the record, Laura Madden and Ashley Judd, but it also involved a lot. We, there, there were not anonymous accusations in there. Our editors were very adamant about that, and there are different news organizations that apply different standards, but in the case of the Harvey Weinstein investigation and a lot of the stories of sexual harassment and sexual assault that the Times have done, you're not, you don't see, um, you, you're, you're gonna see very few anonymous uh, accusations from anonymous uh, you know, victims. Um, and so, you know, it, our story actually was, we realized very quickly that we, you know, that in addition to uh, seeking on the record allegations, which we did ultimately have, that we also needed another body of evidence, which we did include in that first story. So we were able to, um, we had been able to piece together the, the, the trail of secret settlements that had been paid stretching from 1990 to 2015. At the end of the day, we were able to show that Weinstein had paid as many as 12 secret settlements over those years. This was basically like time and again, he had used these as a tool to cover his tracks. And so while many of the, the while many of the women who had entered into those secret settlements did not break those secret settlements in our story, just the fact that we were able to show that they existed became a com an important component. And then we also had obtained, you know, in this like important internal company records in which there were allegations of sexual harassment made against Weinstein. So, uh, you know, I think that the the story, the the title of our book, she said, is is sort of um, you know has a, has a variety of meanings. But I think that. One of them is that oftentimes the model for these types of stories and just more broadly these types of allegations in general have been made in a, just a sort of sh he said, she said vacuum in which both sides can kind of point fingers and the person who's been accused can say there were no witnesses and this person's lying. And we really wanted to make sure that we were creating um, stories in which there was so much evidence that we weren't asking women to go on a out on a limb like that and put them in that position. If we go to the hand in the second row, in the red top. Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, I have a question regarding the journalism as a profession itself. I think as women journalists, we do kind of uh, have uh, this competition with some, of it, some of our male colleagues. And the Me Too, I mean, the entire story itself did kind of create this massive success with the global movement highlighting uh, you know, sexual, like, sexual assaults against women. Uh, I mean, I, I want to hear your side, like your opinion, like how was it for you, I mean, did you receive any sort of backlash from male journalists, you know, as the story went out or any questions, you know, any doubts or any form of intimidation from powerful people in the media? No, the opposite. We've received a lot of support, and maybe there are two, but I think that your question maybe raises um, two interesting points. One is that um, the team that worked on this story at the Times is incredibly diverse. Our boss, Dean Bacay, 
is the first African-American editor of the New York Times. Our editor, Rebecca Corbett, is a groundbreaking figure in journalism. She was actually the, the journalist who took the New York Times masthead to 50-50 female when she was appointed to the masthead, which for our organization was a, was a historic switch to officially have the leadership of the newspaper be half female. So I think that even though we didn't sit around and have you know conversations about newsroom diversity as we were dealing with Harvey Weinstein, but I think it's a real argument for newsroom diversity and kind of no accident in the end that this is the team that did this. The second thing that happened not only with Me Too, um, not only with our story, is that so many of these big Me Too investigations involved men who served as narrators and storytellers for the culture. Roger Ailes, Bill O'Reilly, Harvey Weinstein. Uh, there's a radio host named Garrison Keillor who used to be very popular um, in the United States. Mark Halperin, the male political journalist. Les Moonves, who determined so much of TV programming in the United States. These are the people, Matt Lauer, who was a big famous NBC host. And these were the people who told the story of who we were. They were the narrators. They were the ones who always held the microphone, who were always in charge of what stories got told. And so there was, I think when the allegations accumulated against those men, there was just this sense of recognition like, wait a second, this is the way the storytellers in our culture have actually been behaving? And what does that say about the way these stories have been told and have been shaped? And I think that since that's happened, there has been a little bit of a changing of the guard. If you look at Charlie Rose's old show, who is it hosted by? Christiane Amanpour. I think that is a really fantastic note to end on, and that's all we have time for. Um, Megan, Jody, Marina, thank you so much for joining us here today. And everyone, please thank, join me in thanking.